okay. Well, I hope you stayed. We hope we hope we hope you stayed with us. <laughs> we hope you stayed with us. Uh, here we are. Hey, three of you are there. All right. Sorry for the. Yep, we had a temporary interruption right there. Uh, trying a different phone that was apparently not as happy with the heat source nearby. Trying to give you those good views of uh, what was going on with the glass, and unfortunately. We had to abandon that phone and get another one in here. But we're ready to go back. Todd has got the black glass on the piece. He's using his jacks right now to separate the piece from the blowpipe eventually. By using those pair of metal blades, he's able to uh, constrict the glass right there. And this is where we'll intentionally break it after a while. Yeah, folks, we're back. Technical difficulties, but uh, fortunately, we managed to solve it. Okay, so check on in and uh, keep commenting. And we do have the other video will be stored. So if you commented on that one, your name will get entered in the drawing for the brief piece. And uh, away we go. Okay, so... What are you trying to make it fuzzy? Okay. Now we've got the gold on the interior of this. We've got the white in the middle, and the white's going to provide a nice background or offset for the gold, and then the black exterior. What uh, Todd's doing right now, he's created two jack lines. One of them to pull the major portion of the bubble away from the pipe, the other will be the breakoff point. So right now he's inflating that, and you can see where this narrow. Little, you did it if you want, Josh. Just, you know, something small to tie you. Okay. okay. So, there they go with that. It's me, nothing fancy. Joanna, glad you made it back. And Kristen and Susie, yes indeed. Welcome aboard, everybody. Glad to have you. And uh, apologize for the minor interruption, but the phone overheated and said, uh, Laura Vaughn, once upon a time, got a glass vase made by Bruce, and it's still one of your favorites. Well, thank you so much. Made my day. Okay, so Josh right now is taking a gather on the end of an iron, and he's gone through the black. This is not a blowing iron. This is a solid iron. So we're making a pot right now for your goal to be placed in. In fact, it would probably be absolutely perfect if you want a bunch of those little uh, gold uh, candies that the kids get every year that are shaped like coins or little chocolates. Can't put them in there right now, they'd melt. Okay, repeat my question, since it was what else do you use the stamps for other than the bottom of the rocks glass? We can actually, well, let's watch this foot go on, okay? There's the gather of black glass on it. Todd will shear it free. And then after he reheats it, he'll shape it up. So we can use the stamp for what uh, are sometimes called prunts. Uh, back in the old days, really, really old days, even before Foster's time and mine, when people would sit around the table in the Renaissance period, eating their legs with mutton and getting their hands all greasy, they had to be able to hold on to the glass. So they would put these protrusions on the glass, but of course they didn't want sharp ones. And they would make what were called fronts. And you could put a dollop of glass on the outside of your drinking glass, and that would allow you something to grab hold of when you were uh, getting ready to drink and you didn't have an opportunity to clear the mutton grease off your hand. What do they sell at the fair, Foster? Turkey legs? Yeah. Okay. So if you're in the habit, if you're in the habit of eating the turkey legs at the Ren Fair, and you want a custom-made glass, just let us know sometime, and we'll make you one with prunts on it. And then your hand can be as greasy and messy as you want, and you'll still be able to hold on to the glass. Here we go with the punty, the transfer from the blowing iron to the punty iron. 
drip of water right up on the initial jack line that Todd made, and off it comes. There we go, and the piece is freed, and uh, there's our opening. Okay. So, Joanna, being in the UK, I would like to recommend to you a website of a gentleman I know, and uh, Facebook, he's known as David Glassmakers, okay? And uh, David works with another fellow, and they recreate Roman glass. And it has some really interesting connect collections of where they have taken shards. And I've recently started reading about uh, along the River Thames, when the tide is down, they actually find artifacts from the Roman occupation of that area. So there's a whole lot up there, and it's a really interesting uh, thing. So if you can search David Glassmakers on Facebook, you'll see that he's got a whole bunch of really neat stuff. I'm not absolutely certain that he uh, makes any glasses with prunts on them, but they do some amazing work with uh, uh, terracotta molds. Well, I'm sorry about that. They call them people mudlarks. Mudlarks? Mudlarks. Mudlarks. Mud larks, okay. They're people who go and scavenge. Oh, okay. But you have to be like permitted to do it. My goodness. I got that right. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, we've had several people from the UK visiting and watching, so uh, it might be worth checking out the mudlarks. Figure out. <laughs> Could have kept the meeting green, I don't know. Okay. So our uh, copper metal today, I'm not sure I get the reference, Mary Beth. Okay, so what uh, Todd has here is this is going to be our pot of gold. And the gold is on the interior of this. And as it opens up, we'll get a good view of it. The gold is backed up by a layer of white, which will be a nice uh, background color and allow it to show up. If we'd have put the gold directly onto the black, it might have been very difficult to see. So, um, in just a moment, we'll take a view right down the throat of that and see what we can find again. Thank you for sharing, Joy. We really appreciate that. So, uh, Todd's going to start working on opening this up. This will be the pot of gold. The gold is on the interior. And uh, one of the main reasons for showing you this demonstration today is a different application of a handle. It'll be uh, different than putting it on the side of a drinking glass. He's got a uh, foot on it, a black foot in addition to the body. And then in just a few moments, we'll be opening up and going with that. Remember to like if you like. Uh, that makes us feel good. If you share, we increase our viewership. And by commenting, you get entered in the drawing for next week's freebie. All right, so now we're going to have an opening here. You can see him increasing the diameter of that lip area. And also, as he raises the angle of his hand, the lip flares outward some. So by judging the heats on that, he gets it just right out there perfect. Will that be folded over, Todd? Uh, no, I'm going to keep it right here. Keep it right here. Okay. Now we get like a, a real good view of the pot of gold and we see the gold on the white background. And absolutely, that would not have shown up on a black background. Okay. What's in the bottom left corner of the screen? I don't really know, because I didn't see. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm moving around. <laughs> so if it was when we were down here in the bottom left corner of the screen, oh, you see something like fluttering? Oh, I still see it. I don't know what we got going on there. It might, it's not a piece of paper. I'll come over here, and uh, if we view from this direction, you don't see anything, but you still see that little gray flutter in the lower left corner. We're just we're just so happy to be back online. We don't care what it is. <laughs> if if it's distracting, don't look. <laughs> I'm kidding. 
No. Uh, oh, you know, somebody somebody nailed it. Somebody said the corner of your gel pack. I'll be darned. Let me get that up there. No, I got it. It's gone. Well, how about that? Okay, so here we go. This is what we're, we're here for, so let's watch this. And if I get that gel pack thing, I'll get it out of the way. There we go, on with the handle, stretching it out to almost its full length, and then snip it. And now it has to hang it down, or else it would have fallen onto the vessel. So now by grabbing the tip with his tweezers, and bringing it on up and over, he can attach it. And now he can increase the space in there by either centrifugal force. If it touches up the body, he can just move it away a little bit. And that's a completely different way of adding a handle than what you all have seen us do before. So there you go. It is a cool process. It's also a way in which some people will put the handle on, a bod on the body of a uh, glass or pitcher. But... Uh, Right now he's just pulling it away from the body a little bit. And there we go with our pot of gold and a handle on it. And you can put your gold in it. Or send us some of your gold and it could be yours. Uh, Ida or Todd or somebody will have to establish a price on that. But uh, yeah, that really is pretty cool, Joanna. So what he's got now is a pot. The gold is in the middle. We've got a beautiful handle on it. He can stretch the handle up away. Great place to put a hook under it and hang it. Alrighty, yes, Joanna, it is amazing. Yes, we do have a handle on it, Bridget. Okay. Perfect for Werther's candies. Exactly, they are gold. <laughs> Werther's original. Okay, yes. Don't anybody please suggest lemon Oreos. That won't work. Okay, a little tap, off it comes, and there we are with the gold. The pot of gold goes into the annealer. Let's hear it for Todd. Good morning, Rude. Got here just in time. Uh, if you're just coming back uh, or joining us, uh, Todd just finished up a piece. Uh, we have kind of a... St. Patty's Day theme today, we're calling it Lucky Charms, and that was our pot of gold, all right? And for any of you that uh, might view the videos later, it'll probably show up in two parts. We had an issue with the camera on the first half, but we're back back with you right now. Joyce Ferguson says it's beautiful. Thank you, Joyce. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what we <laughs> I think that's really cool that one of the viewers said maybe it's your gel pack on the back of the camera. I'm looking at it, had no idea. Okay, Josh is going to cut it now. Maybe we'll get a view of his scissors. Oh no, his thumb. Okay, and there we go. That'll take care of it. Okay, uh, and uh, Joshua Penn, Theta will advise you in just a moment about the pot of gold being available. So this morning we've already done the Maryland cat and we've done our pot of gold with handle. So next we're going to be in a moment coming up to the beer beer mug. But we're going to have to talk about something else first because we've got something special going on. We have the Cats for Kids. If you recall, back in November, we raised money for No Kids Hungry. We were all making drinking vessels. Well, this time around, we've got the Maryland Cats with the studio's long association with the Maryland Renaissance Fair, and plus the fact that we're located in Maryland, Todd has chosen the colors of the Maryland state flag to make these beautiful cats. And they are available at $60 a piece, and half of that goes to the charity No Kids Hungry. Uh, if you're ordering from overseas, the shipping will be a little extra, but when you place your order, Theta or someone here at the studio will work that out with you. So there's going to be a limited edition because we're only going to do this for the month of March and we really want to sell a lot of these. Uh, we got a few, there's some that we put on display. 
there's a box getting stacked up and ready to ship. So there are quite a few out there already, and we'd love to have all of you participate. So that's our uh, No Kids Hungry or the Cats for Kids charity. Okay, so get in on that, please. Uh, let's see, we've done the cats, we had the pot of gold with a handle, and now we're going to do a beer beer mug with green beer. So this is a beer beer mug with... I guess a, a lager maybe, but uh, since we're going to be celebrating St. Patty's Day, Josh is going to be making us a beer beer mug with green beer in it. Not sure exactly how many we've sold Bridget, but we're trying to keep Todd so busy he can't see straight. Uh, after we do the beer beer mug, we'll be doing a rocks glass with a shamrock in the bottom. It's pressed into the bottom after it's made. And then we'll be doing a rainbow rondelle. And speaking of rainbows, just for grins and giggles, Foster and I did this yesterday just for fun. We got a gold pot surrounded with a rainbow of colors. So if you want your uh, pot of gold to include the rainbow, there's a sample of one right there. We've got a lot of other green pieces on display today. And if you check our catalog, we've got all kinds of colors and things available that can be adapted. Next week's giveaway will be this beautiful diamond optic ornament, also in the emerald green color, keeping with our theme. And last week's winner is Antoinette, and it was this beautiful uh, round ornament made in a bubble optic mold. So that's really pretty cool. So, Josh, uh, you got your green beer ready? Okay. So Josh is now picking up uh, a piece of emerald green from the annealer. So we showed you the annealers a little while ago. That thing is running at around 900 degrees. It preheats that green glass so that it will adhere to his blowing iron. And now he's going to melt that down. So I'm going to ask him just to pull that back out real quick so you can see. So it's starting to melt some. Thank you. But it's still uh, got the sharp edges on it a little bit. So. No, it doesn't look green. They never look, they never look the right color once they go above a thousand degrees. So Josh will get that really hot and malleable, and then he will uh, roll it out, probably on the marver. Sometimes he goes to the bench and uses the back of the jacks. We have choices on what tools we use. So he'll shape the green and get just a very small amount of air started into it. So you can see it's just kind of wobbled around there, but by laying the iron pretty much flat on the tabletop, he's able to change the shape of that gather of green. You get a nice rounded shape to it. And then in just a moment, he'll blow in the blowpipe, put his finger over the end, the trapped air goes out into the glass, but he's not going to let that inflate a great deal. He's saving that for later. Not so sure about that, Bridget. Okay, so he's got one gather of clear over the green. He's using the cherry wood block. That wooden cup is made of cherry wood. It's kept in water all the time. And when the water hits the hot glass, it creates a bed of steam for the glass to roll on. It's kind of like a, a lubricant. It gives him a nice shape to the glass. And you notice he went right back uh, over to heat the glass up before blowing or anything. The core of that, the dark emerald green, was a different temperature than the clear glass that he put on. So by going back to the glory hole right now, before he blows any more into it, he equalizes the temperature throughout. If you've got hot and cold spots throughout the glass, it doesn't blow out so evenly. So what he's doing right now is blocking it again. It'll give it a more consistent shape. Uh, no, we have not done snorkeling, but we will. 
Snorkeling will be happy to show. Okay, so a little bit of air pressure in the gather, and you can see it start to enlarge and expand. And now it's going to be time just to cool it down some. Now the interesting thing about the beer beer mugs is they're kind of made in reverse order. Uh, we've told you many times as you've watched that we typically make the bottom half of a vessel first and then we turn around on a punty and then we finish the top. But with this beer beer mug we're faced with a problem. We have the green up here which looks like it's at the top of the mug. If we put the white on next to that, it would look like any foam or head from the beer is in the lower part of the mug. And that wouldn't work at all. So when I say we do this in a reverse order, we're making the piece upside down, if you will, the color assembly upside down on this pipe, and then we'll transfer it. So right now, Foster is going to use that hot, fresh glass to pick up some white powder and that white powder will be the little bit of foam that's on the beer. Josh right now is opening up the interior of that. So this will be an open tube. He's also going to cut it out a little bit there where he spread it and it's a little bit thick. So he's going to shear around and get a nice even opening. He'll make that round, get it really symmetrical. Now Foster's glass on the end of his iron has no air bubble in it. It's a solid piece of white glass. Well, it's a solid piece of glass clear in the middle coated with white. And what he'll do in a few moments is bring it over when Josh asks for it. They'll drop it onto the end of the open hole, kind of like a plug. And then, after they do that, Josh will marver it rather quickly to stretch it out some, and then blow into it. And when he blows into it, the expansion will go out into the white. And then we'll have one more set of this process in just a couple moments. So he's ready, he's got his shears. We're gonna come up over here and take a good look. By placing it on the marver, he flattens the end of it. Now he lifts it right up to the top of his gather and snips it off. That's a solid plug of white frit over clear. But by rolling it on the marver, he stretches it out a little bit. And now the air goes in and you'll see the white expand. And that's how he pushes the bubble down even further, okay? So it's very critical to get that filled out because if he didn't, he'd have a very thick section of white over a relatively thinner section of green. Now he's doing the same thing you saw him do previously. He's made a constriction. He's going to knock that tip off of the end. And then he'll open that hole up just like he did previously with the green. And this time, since we don't want the foam, going all the way to the top of our glass and overflowing. We'll have some clear glass at the top. Does that count as Encalmo? Yes, that's what we would call a poor man's Encalmo because it's actually, and we didn't add a cup and we didn't go into the same degree of volume or anything, but yes, I think we could get away with calling that a type of Encalmo. And you're joining two parts together. Yep. So that's the definition. So, you can see that he's opened the white up. It's a consistent diameter with the green. Foster's got the clear. So, what Josh is going to have him take another gather just to have a little more volume. And this will actually be kind of a larger section. You can see the, the ratio of the green to the white, okay? And he's going to put a bit of clear on the end that's going to wind up being longer than that white is. 
it's not only going to be the top of the finished mug, it's also going to be a place for him to insert another blowpipe in. But we'll show you that in a minute. There goes the solid gather. Here comes the marber or flattening on the table. And then once he gets that ridge out of there, he'll blow again. And we should be able to see the bubble appear into the clear glass. Keep your eye on it. The diameter will increase. There it goes. There's the bubble. All right. So, as I said, this section of clear is larger than the white. Not only will it be the top of the drinking glass, the beer mug, it's also going to have to be the place where the next blowpipe goes in. So now you're going to see how... We'll also notice that early in the process, he cut a jack line up close to the pipe. That's so he can separate it easily when this gets done. So now it's back for a reheat. He's going to open up the clear to where it's a consistent diameter with the green and the white. And also put a little bit of a flare right at the end. And then when he asks for it, Foster will deliver the other blowing iron. And they'll stick that into the clear an inch or so and then transfer the color application over to the blowpipe. And then we're right where we want to be to make it. So, Josh has got his jacks in there. He's opening up the clear. It's got a little bit of flare on the end. He'll grip the iron from Foster, put it in, and then kind of pinch the glass onto the pipe so that it adheres well. Then once again, a little bit of water on the original jack line up near the bl other blowing iron, and the whole thing breaks free. There we go. Sometimes it's a little sticky, and you give it a little bit of uh, extra help. Okay. Yeah, it's still a little gooey in there. So, then that has to do with all the heat that's in there. So now, we've got the colors in the correct orientation to be the green beer beer mug. Now it's just a matter of getting things all shaped up, more coatings of glass, and away we go. So, first order of business is going to be to marver this. You'll notice that he's rolling it nice and level. All sections of the glass are touching on the table at first. And then he'll start to close up that tip. That tip was open. That came off of the other blowpipe. So a combination of marvering, perhaps using the jacks or diamond shears, will bring that all down so it can be closed off. And then once it's a closed bubble, then we can get it inflated. So you can still see the opening on the end, and by tweezing just a little bit, Thinning it out some, and it gave him a nice spot to use his diamond shears. Notice that he rolls and cuts, but he doesn't leave the shears in contact with the glass. He keeps releasing them. Were he to leave the shears in constant contact with the glass, they could heat up and stick to it. So now he's going to have that closed off, and now we're where we wanted to be, want to be to make the piece after we got all those colors into it. Yes, Lynn, it is a neat technique. It's uh, Michael Herman, are you still with us? Did you come back after the uh, interruption there for the equipment? We'll see if Michael's out there and respond. Uh, yes, Kristen, this is a lot more work. The beer beer mugs are, uh, involve a lot of work. I mean, if you think about it, he's just now finished up the color design and getting ready to make the piece. But we think that the result is well worth it. Well, I, I haven't seen a response from Michael, but as I recall correctly, the uh, origination of this idea came from an establishment in Corning, New York, where unnamed glass blowers from this facility were enjoying adult beverages. And one of the distributors had up on display on a shelf above the taps a large plastic beer mug. Said glass blowers decided 
We could do that. And now we have beer beer mugs. <laughs> so Josh has let that cool off now sufficiently that he can go ahead and gather. And he wants a pretty substantial gather for this, but if he gets a little too much, he'll take a quick stripping of the glass off the end. And now he's ready to shape and create the bug. He's going to pull a little bit more off the tip. <laughs> Using the wet newspaper, he's able to cool and shape the glass. That's about seven sheets of newsprint folded. It's starting to get near the end of its useful life. It's starting to burn up a little bit, but we can still get, get a little use out of it. So we fold up about seven sheets of newspaper. I'm going to put some water on it for him. You saw it smoking there. So fold it up and wet. It uh, forms a perfect insulator, and you're able to take your bare hand in and actually shape the glass. Into the optic mold he goes because this beer mug's going to have ridges in it. He blows real hard in it. And we'll see the ridges when he comes out. And there we are. There's your ridges that go down the length of the glass. So now it's a matter of having to blow it out, stretch it out, and form the drinking glass. If he blows too much and the end is hot, it will blow out the bottom. So by rolling the glass tip on the marver, he's able to inflate it up at the top. So only the end of the glass got cooled there. You can see how the inflation is up in the middle. It's time to get a jack line in that. We want to do this early in the process before the piece is uh, fully lengthened because it's very hard to get the whole piece hot and cut a jack line when you've got the final length. So now that he's got a jack line in there, he's got the hot glass, he'll work on uh, swinging it out a little bit or letting gravity do it. Looks like he's going to cool the end of it again and blow. It's going to blow gently. When we do this, we inflate it more than we want the diameter of the finished product. Because when this piece lengthens, it will probably come close to doubling that length. It will also get smaller in diameter. If you start out with the diameter that you would like to have at the finish and you lengthen it, then you're going to have one that's too narrow. Well, Kristen, I'm glad you like the explanation. We have a lot of fun with this. Okay, so now you can see him swinging it back and forth, a couple of propeller spins, and now he's getting out toward the full length, and this is why he pretty much overinflated the piece to begin with. He's using the jacks to straighten the body side, almost like a, a portable marver, if you will. And in just a moment, after another application of heat, while Josh has the jacks on the side of the vessel to straighten the body, Foster's going to push in on the bottom. Ah, Josh is going to use the marver first to straighten that side. You can see as he changes the angle just incrementally, it straightens the side even better. So now they've got something really good to work with there. A beer tube, yes. It's been a long time since anybody in here made a yard. <laughs> I, I said it's been a long time since anybody made a yard in here. Yeah, it's been a while, hasn't it? Okay. So, you can see the two of them working there together. It gives a nice crisp bottom to the piece. The force that Josh is using with the jacks, coupled with what Foster had with the paddle, gives us a nice crisp edge on the bottom. Almost looks like a 90 degree angle. Ah! Joy McGeegan says maybe we could do a, a green glass beer funnel. <laughs> that made that made somebody smile. <laughs> Is that bringing back memories? 
Okay, so we get the bottom flattened. We got a little indentation in it. Now that glass is not looking emerald green except right up by the white where it's a little bit cooler. But as this piece cools and eventually anneals, it'll be a beautiful emerald green color. Foster's bringing over the iron. It has the punty on it. If you're new here with us, this is just a transfer from the blowing iron to another iron. You can see that the beer mug is about three quarters complete as far as the body goes. So after he gets this stabilized, a little drop of water on the neckline he created and a tap and it will break free. When we do that, we're really careful not to get the water down onto the vessel itself because it could scar it. Or if it's cold enough, it could actually crack it. So now we've completed the transfer. Yes, you can just see the green starting to appear. And in a few moments, what you're going to see is more of the green at the bottom. So we've transferred the vessel. We've only got the top, oh, 25 to 30 percent of the vessel to finish, which means the lower three quarters doesn't need to be reheated a lot. It needs to be held above a thousand degrees pretty well so that it doesn't crack. But as Josh reheats mainly the opening or the mouth of the vessel, the rest of it will get a few hundred degrees cooler and you'll start to see the green in the bottom of the piece. The glass on the mouth up there was cold enough to fracture when he broke it free of the blowpipe. It takes a little longer to reheat it now to get it soft enough to actually manipulate. Josh, you can see, is kind of looking up over the top. He's looking past the piece and into the glory hole to see how the mouth is looking. We can see where the heat's concentrated. It's from just below the white line down. And he'll begin to open that with his jacks. Okay. And yes, if there's any Guinness fans out there, we can do this with a dark stout. I'm going to go green, though. Green Guinness. Okay. By rolling on the marver, even though he's on the punty, he can straighten out the sides of the vessel really nice. And you can hear those ridges as they rattle against the marver. Now he's going to just make sure that the body's got the perfect shape that he wants. And like most glasses that have been poured, it's not a completely straight line, but you wouldn't expect that on the foam that's in the beer. Foster's job now will be to reheat the piece, what we call a flash heat, a moment, momentary introduction to the heat. And after he does that, he'll bring it back to the bench. Josh is shaping up the glass for the handle. Josh will grab his diamond shears to grip the pipe and then he'll place it onto the body of the mug. He'll lift up on it and thin it out some and then snip it. When he snips it, Foster turns it 180 degrees. Josh gets his alignment, attaches the handle lightly, and he'll use this carbon bar to roll up against the body. So watch this action right here. He's pushing upward against the body for a nice, secure fit. By turning the pipe like that, the centrifugal force throws the glass a little bit away from the body. And look at that beautiful taper where it starts thick at the bottom and thins out coming up. That's all a result of what he's doing with the spinning there. He'll take another heat. You're starting to see the green show through a little better. He's got a few seconds to go into the glory hole, warm the handle up for just a moment more, then he'll bring it out, do a final shaping, and you can notice that it did change shape a little bit. When he brushes the sides, that's so he can make it straight, and then those motions there where he creates the arc gives him that beautiful handle.
He'll put just a tiny drop of water at the joint between the body and the funky iron, tap it, and off it comes in Foster's hand and away to the annealer. Let's hear it for Josh. Yes, that was truly awesome. Another amazing piece. Great job, guys. Come on, let's see some thumbs up, some hearts. Show the people some love. Okay. Great job, Josh. Thank you very much. Yeah, That's a beautiful you, piece. Thanks. Beautiful piece. Thank you, Foster. All righty. Okay, we're on a roll here. Let's go back on down to the display area and see what we can find, what kind of trouble we can get into today. All righty. So... I'm going to mention the Maryland Cats right away because that's a big emphasis for us and that was the first thing we did. If you were with us back in November, we had a charity uh, fundraiser and we each made drinking glasses and a lot of you ordered those and we were able to donate a couple thousand dollars to No Kids Hungry. And we're back at it again, but this time we have a slightly different emphasis. Given the studio's uh, long history with the Maryland Ren Fair, and also the fact that we are in Maryland, Todd, our chief cat maker, has come up with what he calls the Maryland cat. And these are the colors that you would see in the state of Maryland flag. And this is going to be a limited edition. These will only be available for order during the month of March. And also with a limited edition, they'll be signed and numbered and then that's going to be it. So uh, the Maryland cat we demonstrated first off in the video and if you're searching for it be advised we had a little technical difficulty and had to switch cameras so this video might show up in two parts but if you look for the Lucky Charms broadcast and there's two of them you'll find us. Anyway the Maryland cats if you're ordering from outside the continental US There'll be a slight extra charge for shipping. You can check with Theta to find out what that would be. But of the $60 that the cats cost, half goes to charity. So we really would, uh, really would like to have you participate. I'll get to your question there in just a moment, uh, David. Okay, so there's the cats. We did a pot of gold with a handle. Todd did that. We got the... Uh, St. Patty's Day thing going on, thinking of leprechauns and pots of gold and rainbow. You just saw Josh make the beer beer mug. Ah, Josh Penn purchased the pot of gold. Thank you, Josh Penn. All right. So, all righty. So let's, uh, the next thing we're going to do is a four-leaf clover rock. But before we do that, we'll cover the table a little bit here. Uh, David Hogan just asked us a question about a piece of wood, and it is. It's a piece of glass blown into the wood. The wood has been carved especially so that you can insert the glass, blow against the wood as if it were a mold, and then you can remove the glass for annealing, and then once it's fully annealed, you can place it back into the wood. So we don't leave it in the wood while it... Uh, Go, it goes into the, the annealer. It comes out, gets annealed, and back in. So uh, we've got some other pieces, and in fact, we've got a really couple of exciting ones that we're going to show you probably a little later in the spring where we've combined wood with glass. So that's what you saw back there, David. Um, this piece right here was uh, fun to do. Foster and I did that yesterday. It's a gold pot with a rainbow, and we were just messing around. And uh, here's one that Todd made about 20 years ago. We've got all kinds of green pieces here on display. We can give you uh, whatever kind of Irish colors you may want out of anything in our catalog. So be sure to get in touch with us there. And here are a couple of uh, green-themed stemless wine glasses. And this is what's coming up next. A rocks glass. Some people call them whiskey glasses. But uh, seeing as how we want to stick with Ireland, we'll call it Irish whiskey, or maybe you could put your Jamesons in this. And these are a lot of fun to make. I did that one yesterday. That's probably going to go off to one of my kids, unless one of you wants to buy it. Okay, so Josh is going to make us now a four-leaf clover or a sham rock. Thank you, Bridget, for that suggestion. So uh, 
Let's go. Let's go have a shamrock. All right. Shamrock, right? Shamrock rocks. A uh, shamrock. Yeah. Shamrock rocks. <laughs> All Just right. In time for the shamrock shake. It's a shamrock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, my wife loves the shamrock. Shamrock shapes it, oh shapes it. McDonald's, yeah. Where does it come from? McDonald's. McDonald's sells uh, for okay. for the holiday right. a shamrock oh, shake. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's Foster. You're gonna make this. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I thought Josh was. They don't. They never tell me anything. Part time help is hard to find, especially good part time help. Right. So. I tell them that's what you get when you hire the handicap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, rude. Uh, Theta posted a picture of a piece late last week. Said it was very popular, uh, most viewed picture in 2018 or something. And you ask about the cane in it. So uh, Foster's getting set up right now with his first gather of glass. He's going to shape that up a little bit and then dip it into the green frit. I've already got some green frit in the metal ring. Okay, so there's our coverage for the bottom of that. And we don't use a whole lot of color down in the bottom of it. Uh, just a little bit down in the, the very base of the first layer. And then the rest of it's going to be all surrounded with uh, clear glass. So, Root, I'll throw, I'll, I'll throw some information your way as, as we do this, and uh, if we actually demonstrate that piece in the future, we'll give you a heads up so you can watch. But what Root's referring to is a cane piece that had sections of it where the cane was very dense and other sections where it uh, looked like it spread out. Okay, there we go. He's getting the side shape, so he gets a beautiful cylindrical shape on that. And then he can go ahead and trap the air in it, set the bubble. There it comes out into the glass. It bulges a little bit where it expands. But once he gets that to where he wants, he can roll it on the marver and bring it back down to that perfect cylindrical shape. So anyway, Rude, that uh, design you saw was what might be called a happy accident or an unintended consequence. It's kind of like when my wife trusts me to do the laundry and I use the wrong temperatures and the colors bleed or spread out, if you will. Well, that's exactly what happened with the cane on that piece. The central pore with the white stayed dense and tight and had coloration to it but as the piece blew out, it spread. So you can look that up. Theta posted the picture on uh, Facebook last week, and that's all I'm going to say about it. But Rude had asked. Okay, so now he's ready for the second gather of glass. Foster will get that covered up with another coating of clear, and then he'll come back to begin shaping. You can see the ring of green down toward the bottom. There's some really neat optical effects when you look at this. Let me see if I can get one from over here. If we look into the bubble that Foster has in there, it looks almost like there's a green dot in it in addition to down in the piece. But there's not. It's a reflection. And if we could get a good view of that, there's actually a lot of heat preventing a good view. But the bubble is separated a little bit from the bottom. So now he's got the volume of glass he wants. He's going to set the jack line. This is going to be the point where the uh, whiskey glass or rock separates from the blowpipe. Notice when he dips it down like that. I'll try to avoid taking the camera with him, although it is a neat optical effect. That's to lengthen it, okay? Now he's going to straighten the sides up some with his jack blades. And if all that pushing pushes it back too close to the pipe, he'll dip it again. Otherwise, he goes with what he has there. Okay, 
So he had, what, about a minute or so of working time, minute and 20 seconds? It's back to the glory hole for an extra 2,300 degrees of heat and get it soft enough to manipulate again. Constantly turning the pipe because we have no gravity free zones in here. Give it a little bit of air just for some more expansion. He's free blowing now. He's not putting his finger over the pipe and trapping the compressed air. He's just blowing gently for a little bit of inflation. Kristen, we're glad that you love watching Foster work, and I imagine that he misses seeing all of you guys at the Renaissance Fair. Okay, so straightening the sides up on this, getting the bottom flattened. He's going to get this all worked out to where he wants, and then they'll do the transfer. Okay, so he's asked Josh for a punny. He's got the glass shaped up, got the size he wants and everything. Getting the taper set. A little bit of an indentation in the bottom to receive the punty. That helps because if there are any little shards on it, once before we polish it, they won't stick out below the bottom of the piece. Here comes Josh with a tiny bit of glass on the bottom of an iron. And then he'll bring it over to Foster, who will place it in the center of the bottom. Now, if you've watched enough of these videos, you've seen that we have several different ways of working with the punty when we're doing the teamwork. Quite often, Foster goes and makes his own punty while somebody else flashes the piece. In this case, he's accepting the punty that Josh made. He'll get it centered up. He's in charge of guiding it into the center bottom and then he'll decide when to break it free of the blowpipe. A little drip of water right onto the neck, and then a tap on the iron will break it free. There we go. All righty. So it's the vibration that breaks the glass. The vibration when he strikes the iron, travels down the length of the iron, gets to that joint where he had cut a neckline, and then the water has cooled it to the point that that's the weakest spot. And those vibrations from tapping the iron with the punty is what breaks it free. When we get toward the end of the piece, he'll put a little bit of water in the joint between the punty and the bottom of the piece, and again, a tap of the iron breaks it free. Once again, that piece was cold enough to fracture, it takes a while to reheat. So this is probably one of the longer reheats on the piece because we have to get that lip of the air of the vessel hot enough to move. Yes, Patrick, we try to make the rock glasses have a, a decent bit of weight to them. That way uh, they're not so easy to knock over <laughs> if, you're, if you've been using them. <laughs> for a while. Okay, so Foster's heating the top of the vessel, the mouth, and in just a few moments he's going to come back to the bench and he'll work on opening the vessel up and perhaps steaming it a little bit with his steam stick. The back of the jack, so the strap, the hinge if you will, forms a nice surface to go ahead and flatten the lip of the vessel and then the steam cone. Just like the cup, uh, uh, blocks or the wooden cups that we have, soaked in water, the water enters the hot vessel, becomes steam, and you can see that blowout. And he's got a perfectly nice side there, all from that small opening and the steam stick. Now he'll go back in a moment and reheat that so he can finish opening it up.
He uses the newspaper, the wet newspaper, to chill the side a little bit so it doesn't get too hot. It's got a really nice shape to it, a really good uh, line, nice straight line. Jacks are better to open. Yeah, they, they do a lot better in a bottle opener. I'm kidding, David. Yeah, the, jack, the jacks are, are good for opening. Uh, Foster does have an assortment of jacks on his bench. He uses them for different applications. And we also have the wooden jacks or parchofis, which are sometimes used. So, yeah, we have a, a variety of jacks, but they're, they're pretty good for opening. If any of you are glass blowers or have observed it elsewhere, uh, some people use what's called an opening stick. They have a single piece of wood with a rounded surface to it, and they use that to open. Now, just like you saw Josh roll the beer beer mug on the marker to straighten the sides, that's what Foster's doing right there. He gives them a nice straight line on that. And then he can heat the top of the vessel, the face of it, if you will, and open it up. He's getting that lip hot so it will move, plus an inch or two of glass down below that because you never just get one little piece. Ah, he's going to give us a little more inflation here with the steam cone. This also really helps with the... Uh, length, the, the height of the vessel. So every time he blows that out and increases the wall size, by the time he gets around to opening it, he's got a lot more uh, glass to open up for the top. So it's, it might even be, how would, what would you say, Foster, that last uh, steaming gave you an extra three quarters to an inch of height? Uh, no, not that much. Not that it, much? It, about a half inch. Okay. Half, yeah, half inch. So that, that helps him adjust it and get it just a little longer. And in the background over there, we've got Todd making Maryland cats. There they go. So order yours and we can get them out to you. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Foster's getting the lip of the vessel hot. And now he'll come back over. Open the vessel up more. If, and Josh will use the paddle to flatten the lip. I think that's a good idea. Kristen says that... Uh, her husband started recently drinking Jameson's, and the size seems perfect, and she might need one for him. And, oh, by the way, her too. <laughs> okay, well, you can def definitely order them. All right, uh, Theta can help you out on a price. And uh, Foster is now straightening the side of this. Gets his nice straight line going up the side. Sharon says she can almost taste the Jamesons now. Wow. we got quite a crowd here. Some of us are going to be eating greasy turkey legs and having mugs with prunts on them. Some of us are going to be enjoying a Jameson. Uh, the electric bill, Joy, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a business, and any business has uh, has expenses, but for us, it's primarily propane. Our uh, All of our furnaces, glory holes, annealers, well, a couple of the annealers are electric, but most everything is gas. So these glory holes that are all lit right now are each using propane. There is no glass in them. There's a propane burner. The propane is mixed with air under pressure, and that's what gives us a really hot flame and can get these tubes of cement, if you will. Have you ever heard of uh, King of the Hill? The show King of the Hill? Yeah. You gotta say it like that. You gotta say propane and propane, propane. accessories. <laughs> oh, yeah? yeah? Well, I haven't heard it from you guys, but at some time in my past, 
people were teasing me about sounding like the guy from King of the Hill. Yeah, okay. Just on the basis of that, I just... Okay, but if there's a propane reference, I'll go for it. I'll, I'll find an episode. At any rate, uh, we do use a lot of propane here. But well worth it, because you can see all the beautiful glass that's created, and we certainly enjoy bringing it to you. Hank Hill, yes, that's the name. Uh-huh. So what, I've become Hank Ferguson or, or Bruce Hill? Okay, so Foster's going to finish this up by rounding it out. Josh will paddle the lip flat. We'll have a nice glass here. Okay. So is this going to be like a uh, a Facebook quiz, Josh? What what cartoon character are you? <laughs> Foster is now using the butter knife to chip around the punky joint rather than putting the water on it. He's going to break it off and it's going to land on that fiber frax pad, which is an insulating material. Stands up to the heat, and once he breaks the punty free. He blows that little bit of extra glass off. Josh is going to use the torch and really heat that center area. So we heat an area about the size of a quarter. And it looks like Foster blew his shard of glass into a piece of paper that's burning over there. A piece of plastic, actually. Yeah. Forget teenage boys and fire. <laughs> All right, they're going to get this really hot on the bottom so that Foster can press the uh, piece into that. He's going to press that metal mold into the piece and it'll leave the impression of the shamrock. He gets the center, he presses down all the way around, presses hard, that goes down in, leaves an imprint, and then once he releases that, we should be able to see. Oh yeah, yes, there it we is. Can. There it is, okay. Yeah. Now a gloved hand, and off it goes. Yeah, I think we've got a good shot. Okay, yeah. excellent. There you go. Very good. Into the annealer it goes. Is the stamp mold preheated? No, it's not. Um, we're not too worried about that. It's uh, short enough contact time, plus the hot glass on the bottom is extremely hot. It's very, very hot. Uh, so we're not making a lot of uh, temperature differential there. Now, I haven't seen the stepladder over here, so I've got to wonder, what's the stepladder for? What's the stepladder step for? Well, somebody mentioned a yard. Oh, uh, yeah. You're going to make a yard? We're going to try. We're going to try. Okay. I haven't done one in Okay, 15, if it doesn't... Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. Okay, so since we're not that not that uh, we have any type of issues here with adult beverages, but we've been talking about beer, and for those of you that may not be familiar with it, there's a term called a yard. It's a yard of beer, and it's basically going to be a glass tube with a bulb on the end of it, and if done well. If done well, it's three feet long, it's a yard, and because of its shape, it's not typically annealed, is it? No. And, and it's going to be thin enough. So, we get this done, and like, like Josh said, it's probably been 18 years or more since anybody here made one. Uh, it's not something that we have a lot of call for, but since I mentioned it earlier, he figured, what the heck? Maybe we'll do a half a yard. No, nah, no, nah, go for the full thing. So anyway, the idea here is to get the air out into the glass and get it fully expanded fairly evenly. <laughs> He's going to block this now to... Uh, is this in place of the funnel? Yes, yes, yes. Because most people with the funnel only get a 12 ounce beer. If this works out, it's a lot more. It's more than 12 ounces. It's more than 12 ounces. So he's going to cool the pipe off a little bit. He's going to take another gather. 
Yeah, Patrick, that is the key phrase, if done well. Actually, it's, it's, it's tricky to do. It's very tricky to do. That's why I put up three pipes. Oh, my goodness. He's determined to succeed. Or is that just for luck? Yeah. Okay. If you've got the extra two pipes up, you don't need them. That's correct. If we didn't have another pipe warming up, we'd find the need for it. And you can see the rainbow of colors laid out here on the marver. So after this temporary improvisation, we get back to the order of doing the uh, rondo. Well, the idea is of hoping, hoping I can make the yard, let it cool down, make the rondel, and then hopefully open the mouth of the yard. Okay. So that's the hope. That's a lot to do. Yeah. Bridget Blakemore says when they start IVs, they always have one more needle on the table just for good luck. There you go. Ooh. Could this product be delivered intravenously? <laughs> <laughs> no. The answer to that is no. So when Josh talks about trying to get all these different things done in a minimum number of steps, what he's depending on is, his, of course, is his skill, which is considerable, but he has to be reading the heat. He's looking at the motion of the glass. He's looking at the heat distribution. If you look at it with us right now, you can see that the bottom third of the glass is hotter than that toward the pipe, simply because of the incandescent glow. He's controlling that heat. He wants a fairly even bubble through the top part of it. When this does get elongated or swung out, the thinner reaches of the top of this will stabilize and cool. Oh, Bridges says there actually is such a thing as IV caffeine. I might have to do that. Okay, so you can see that he's got a lot of glass down in the bottom of that. Everybody's getting together to try to help out, and all I'm doing is holding the camera and running my mouth. But Josh is getting the heat throughout that to the degree he wants, and with the minimal amount of space that he has on the marver, unless he wants a rainbow yard, he's cooled the tip a little bit. He watches the heat. That's why he's looking at it. Just a little bit of air, and then once again, notice he didn't blow for a very long time. That piece is pretty long. You can see how quickly he's rotating the pipe. He's trying to keep that under control. Angling down gives it a little bit of elongation. It's beginning to stabilize just a little bit. Now he'll swing it back and forth. Let the centrifugal force elongate it. The extra heat in the bottom and the weight from the thicker glass is pulling it out. And by golly, I think he's going to get to the yard. He's at least at two and a half feet. He's spinning it around. There we go. Okay, so while he turns it and blows gently, Todd is squeezing a jack line, if you will. All he needs is a little bit of a crease right there. He doesn't really need to have a full deep jack line. You can see the bulbous bottom created there from what while Josh was blowing. That's pretty darn close. Okay, so the shears are cooling the pipe. Todd's getting the Ladder out of the way, heating the gloves. He's going to receive the piece from John. A little bit of water. 
There it goes. Now, into a cradle over there. And we're going to let it cool. And there you go. So that will definitely hold more than your 12 ounces. You're going to okay. open it up. Uh, yeah, we'll let it cool. And yeah. So now we'll do the rondo. You want to explain about the opening? I'll do the rondo first. And yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. So the circular, the round shape of that is going to keep the glass stresses from breaking it. You know how we always tell you, if we lay the piece out on the floor, it'll crack. And it's possible that might, but because of the roundness of it, and the evenness of the wall thickness, the heat should dissipate evenly. I was a little reluctant to swing it too much. <laughs> yeah. But you could see that by the heat that he had in it, and the extra weight in the bottom actually pulled it out. Yes, Patrick, uh, Todd heated the gloves. If the cold gloves go in contact with the glass, that can sometimes crack it. And at the point that Todd was taking it from Josh, the glass had cooled considerably. It had stabilized a lot and was set up. Normally when we put a piece away, uh, we will heat the gloves up a little bit, and that helps it from touching and cracking the glass. So now what we're into is the rainbow rondel. And Josh is going to be gathering glass, and then he'll run the glass through these stripes of color. Then after he's done them in these stripes of color, he'll shape his gather up, get air into it, the amount that he needs, and then go into the diamond optic mold and create the diamond impressions. So while he cools that off, we'll show you the inside of this diamond mold that he's going to use. And that's it right there. Looks kind of like a infinite row of shark's teeth. Or if you want to look at the uh, curvature in there, the design, kind of looks like a Fibonacci pattern. Anyway, we've got those in there. So he's got his glass now. He's going to stabilize that and shape it, get it to the length he wants, and then we'll be picking up color. Yes, Rude, that's a, that's a big mold. Or I, I'm assuming that's what you were talking about. That's going to be what he's required to uh, get this massive amount of glass in there. Yep, looks like a cracking mouth. The other thing that it reminded me of is the worms from Doom. Again, the newspaper is several layers thick, folded and wet. Makes a really good insulator. We'll keep this wet for him. It's, uh, like we said, it's about the end of its useful life. Put a little water on here. So with those bands separated, he's picking up the orange. There's the yellow. Now he'll go back for some more heat. Yep, Roy G. Biv, every electrician's favorite saying. Now this is going to be a rondelle, so everything's going to get spun out. So he started with the orange, but he'll wind up putting the red up close to the blowing iron. And it's just got a, uh, a little bit of that last color right in the end. Is that the violet at the tip? Yeah. Vi okay. Yeah, so the area on the lip, since it gets spun out, that band narrows down quite a bit. So you can see I made that band the widest. Red was the widest. Now 
Now he can go back over those colors, reestablish his lines. Okay, Cindy, as far as a color difference, yes, it, uh, sometimes we have put all the colors together in individual lines, but right up against each other. But in that case, if you need, say, one, but not others, it's kind of hard to control. So by separating the lines, he could have made one large uh, layout of all the colors in narrower lines and very close together, even touching. But then what happens is you don't have quite as much control over picking up an individual color. Everything blends together. You'll still get the differentiation, but it's a little hard to get it exact. Plus, if you line them up touching, then you're mixing your colors a little bit. Yeah. And nobody wants to go through and pick out all those little pieces of frit one from another. Right. At least I don't. Another advantage to putting the red on the outside is the uh, violet and the blue and the green are extremely soft colors and they spread and move a lot more. And if they're out toward the outer reaches when he goes to spin this out, it's a little more tricky. By keeping the red and the orange and the yellow, which will be at the outside of the sphere, it'll work out a lot better. You can see the colors, you can't tell what they all are, but you can see a line of differentiation. Especially down toward the tip where you see the green, blue, and violet down there, you can really see that happening. Now what he needs to do is get this piece turned around or straightened out so that he can go in that optic mold. So it's a pretty wide opening, you can see. He's going into that one right there, but he's going to marver this or shape it down to more of a cylindrical shape that's kind of bulged right now. He wants to get it so it pretty much fills that mold. When he blows out really hard, he wants that glass to throw out into those recesses. So now he's going to taper it down. You can see the angle of the iron. He's not quite level yet, and it gives it a little bit of taper. If you look at the iron, the back end of it is held up a little higher than the front, but not much. And that's also because this mold is tapered. He's making sure it fits, and he's got the exact taper on the glass that it matches up to the mold. He has to get this really hot before he puts it in there. Just a little more shaping here. And you can kind of see the thickness of the bubble right now. If you look at it, there's a, you can see the wall thickness. And that's what's going to be thrown out into the mold, is that thicker part of glass. So the goal here is to get an uh, even wall thickness throughout, along the sides and across the bottom. superheating it to the point that it almost drips into the mold and then blowing very, very hard. And then he has to actually twist the pipe and suck in on the glass. There, see it's lengthening. He presses down. There's the blow hard. Then he draws in and he twists the glass to release it from those pins. And he got it. <laughs> so he's got all the colors in there. He's got the ridges going all the way down it. And you can see the depth of those ridges and now he can blow it out a little bit. Then with a little more heat to it, in just a few moments he can begin to cut the jack line.
jack line is cut very close to the edge where the uh, the bubble lock, I mean the optic stop. Yes, David, that was a little bit of suspense, but he handled it masterfully. <laughs> Foster and I probably looked at it with more anxiety than Josh did. He just kept working it and knew that it was going to come out or not. And it, it did take him a little longer than usual, but that's the way it goes sometimes. But as we say, it's not what you can make, it's what you can fix. Notice him point that up in the air. It brings the piece back more toward the pipe makes it more squat and round. It's going to flatten the bottom gently and create a place for Foster to bring him a bunny in a moment and attach it. He's also pushing in just a little bit and you can see that this shape is almost hemispheric. Okay, so he's got all the colors in there. He's got a nice compact shape. We don't want to go with a long cylinder on this because then it's very difficult to keep it under control and spin it out. What we'd ideally like is a shallow vessel. And see, that's why he's pointing it up in the air. When he points it up in the air, gravity forces the glass back toward the blowpipe. Yes, it does look like a pineapple. And in fact, many people call that mold a pineapple bowl. All right, so there he's got the bottom set on it. He's pushing the jack line in there just to keep it away from the pipe a little bit. And then he'll center it up and attach it. Now all of this is very hot. You may be able to perceive that he has to keep tapping the vessel itself to get it in alignment. If it's a little high on one spot, he gives it a little nudge with the tweezers, and then he can center up the pipe. Now, water on the jack line, create a point to fracture, and the applied vibration cracks it free. Foster gets it over to the glory hole and begins the heating process. You can begin to see some of the colors showing now, and that will become more apparent as we go along. Josh is going to open this up fairly wide because the neckline is constricted. Oh, don't be scared, Cindy. He's done it a million times. Okay. Yes, that's correct, Rude. We didn't. We don't have a cheater on there, but that punny will probably break off with just a tad of its glass left on there. So he has to open up the small opening on the end of it first. And then at some point he'll be able to get the parchofis or wooden jacks in there. Again, that uh, point was cold enough to fracture. This is like the longest reheat in the process, getting the lip of that soft enough to move. He's going to need to open that to the diameter eventually of a couple of inches. And then he'll be able to get the wider blades of the wood jacks in there. So there you can see the opening. And it's very, very hot. See how it's moving all around. He's starting right off with the parchofis. He's got a nice diameter to work with. We've heard a lot of glass blowers express the opinion that you should always have the glass moving, should never have any of it cold enough to stand still. We don't normally do a lot of that, but uh, you're seeing Josh with that right on the edge there. He's got a lot of it moving, he'll open it up, and then eventually, that's right Bridget, hot glass moves, cold glass don't. I've even got, I've even got the viewers saying it, I'm so happy. I've got a t-shirt that has that on it. <laughs> okay. Yes, Patrick, it would make a beautiful bowl. And it's right there right now at a beautiful bowl shape. 
You can notice with the speed of rotation how it is that he's keeping that under control. So now, we've got the full diameter of the glory hole available. He's going to heat all of it. The whole thing needs to be hot. If he only got the lip area hot, even though that outer edge needs to flare out, it would be a real problem because it would be bowl shaped at the bottom and very wide on the lip. So by turning as slowly as he can, and keeping it from spinning out all the way right now. He gets a great deal of heat into it. And then when it starts to move on him a bit, maybe fold over, you'll see him pick up the speed. You can't really see the colors too well in there because of the bright background, but take a look at his hand speed as we do this. As he moves along, he's letting the heat soak in, keeping the piece under control. Then in a moment, you can see those fingers moving a little faster. And though we can't quite see it, he's within about an inch of the diameter of that glory hole. So he's very close to where it would hit. Once he gets that heat absorbed, you'll see him really pick up the speed. There it goes. Yep, and now he's just rolling it. That's going to get it going faster and flatter. I'm going to come around over here so you can get a view of the flat edge on that. There's your thickness of the rondel. A knife edge. We'll be able to see many of the colors start to appear. The blue and the green and the violet you can see down in the center of the piece somewhat. The red, orange, and yellow will appear later and definitely after the annealing process. All the marks from the pineapple mold are in there. So now it's just going to be a case of a little bit of water on the joint. He's waiting for all motion to stop. Caps it free and away we go. Foster will stand it up on edge of the annealer and there it'll sit till the end of the day. Thank you, Josh. Amazing. Beautiful job. Come on, let's have it. Hearts. Thumbs up. Love for Josh and Foster. Oh my. Okay, great work, guys. Alrighty, so let's go down here for a quick recap or a nightcap. I guess, hey, if we broadcast at night, could we have a nightcap instead of a recap? Oh, okay, so we showed you the Maryland cat. I'll explain all that in a moment. We did a pot of gold with a handle, a green beer beer mug, a uh, rock glass with a, uh, actually it was Bridget suggested we call it a shamrock, and you just saw the rainbow rondelle. And as a bonus feature, we had the uh, yard, so don't go away. Are you going to uh, heat it and open it? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, we're going to try this. So he's got the insulated gloves on, and he's going to have a minimally opened glory hole so he can put the opening of the vessel up in there and start heating it. Okay, so he's got to have those insulated gloves so he can hold it, even though the piece had cooled down quite a bit in the cradle over here. It's still very hot. This is not going to really thermal shock it. He's carefully turning. He's looking at the end of it as he looks over the piece to see if it's starting to soften. And then, maybe if we move this cradle back out of the way. Are you going to do this on the oak gas? Uh, maybe I'll just hold it. Hold it. that out of the way. Okay, so he's getting the end of that heated up, and that's all that he's going to heat. Then he'll turn around toward Todd with it, and Todd will put the jacks into the opening, 
And then also while he's using the jacks and Josh is turning, he'll have a small paddle to flatten the lip. Not sure what a torch is, Rude, but if it's like a clamping device with like five or eight fingers, we've seen those before. We don't have one in the studio here. I think what Rude's talking about, folks, is a clamp-like device that has fingers on it that would extend. But I didn't hadn't heard of it called a torch before. Okay, Josh is getting that hot now. Oh, use a torch. Okay. Well, we could use a torch on it, but the glory hole, except for the uh, uh, small oxygen propane torch, is probably as hot as we need. Plus, we'd have to have one person holding the torch and him turn. Big flame. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Here we go. The end is soft. You can see kind of a yellow glow to it. Going to get it a little bit hotter. So anyway, the digression uh, there actually would introduce you into a new tool, and there is something that flame workers use, and it uh, is used to grab a piece and rotate it in the flame. And it's usually like a handle. In our case, we might have one about a uh, handle about 12 inches long, and then a series of fingers that are spring loaded that extend from the handle and go out and grip the piece of glass. Oh yeah, I think we're always, you always have the yards made with rounded bottoms so you can't set it down. You gotta drink the whole thing. Now actually, I think when people have them on display, they're actually hung in a rack, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, so. Now we can see a lot more heat in that. Now that's Josh is turning, you can see the flare occurring in the lip from the angle of the jacks, the paddle on it, and there we go. All right. Awesome. Okay, there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there we go. There's the yard. And we inserted that, and we also in the show. And please, I know some of you got to go to work or get off your lunch break, but let us just tell you real quick once more about the Cats for Kids, a charity event that we're sponsoring, limited to the months of March. Uh, Todd has come up with a beautiful color plan based on uh, pretty much the Maryland flag, and we're calling these the Maryland Cats. And they're going to be a limited edition. They'll be signed and numbered. They're $60 each. Half of that is going to No Kids Hungry, the charity we raised money for back in November. So we would love for you to participate. Uh, get in touch with us and you can order yours. We've got quite a few being made right now. And uh, the only extra expense would be if there's any overseas shipping. Okay, so there you go with that. Uh, last week's prize winner was Antoinette with that ornament. This week's prize, for those of you that commented, is here. And please remember, this video may show up in two parts. We had some camera difficulties about uh, halfway through the second piece. So, from the Art of Fire, goodbye, good luck, we'll see you next week.